What has been your best success story in, fire, in a fire effects monitoring project? We had in 2002 the Rodeo Chetuskai Fire in Arizona. One of, well, probably the largest fire, wildfire, recorded in Arizona history. And um, we were asked, myself and my crew, were asked to help in monitoring the immediate post-fire effects. And I was very um, happy with the crew's response and the fact that our protocols were able to respond to what they wanted us to do. We took the protocols that we normally use and just massaged them a little bit and said, well, these are our, um, this is what the immediate post-fire effects look like. And what they were really concerned with was looking at areas that had been treated for fuels mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. areas that hadn't. But you could actually see, and it was incredible, the difference you could see whether the area had been, uh, to use an overused term, nuked on one side of the road and then on the other side of the road where it had been treated mm -hmm. previously, several years even there were green trees still there in an area that had burned and fire effects that I'd never seen before. I was really amazed. It was really kind of sad in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so we were able to give them the crew and their time and then also collect information for them and contribute to a fire effects report. I guess one of the most successful projects I've had recently with my crew is a mechanical treatment monitoring project that we just started this year and it's a new protocol with new objectives and the crew and I sat down together to discuss why we were monitoring this project, what our objectives were and what the best methodology would be to monitor them and we looked at the literature and they, the crew, was involved in deciding how to monitor and we have the latitude to do that because it's a new protocol and because mechanical treatment monitoring is new for us and with that level of involvement those employees, not only did they come up with a great methodology for monitoring, but they really dove into it and did an outstanding job. And um, their creativity and, and good quality of work really paid off for us. All righty, the next question is, what fire effects monitoring assignment had the biggest surprise for you? I set up a bunch of plots in preparation for prescribed burns and some of them didn't get burned due to weather or whatever. Some of them didn't get burned and so they've been sitting there for four years and they turned out to be a good way to monitor the bark beetle mortality that has happened in the last three, two years. Because I had the before data, I didn't know I was getting it, but I had it. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to go back and remeasure and see what the tree mortality was. So even though those plots seemed like they weren't doing anything, it, they turned out to be quite useful. Mm, yeah. uh, I was surprised at the regenerative capabilities of the forest uh, for the north slope, on the north slope, uh, during the Helens II fire this past summer. Um, we went out to try and collect some preliminary uh, erosion data just by spray painting the, the rebar on the plots that we had out there. <clears throat> and uh, when we went out there, it was about two weeks after the, uh, after the fire and some of the ridge lines had gotten, uh, <clears throat> for lack of a better word, nuked. Mm -hmm. And um, so we had a whole bunch of just uh, overstory sticks, black sticks, essentially uh, hanging out. And underneath those, PTAC, uh, bracken fern, had already started to re reclaim the soil. Two years ago at Grand Canyon, we had the uh, Swamp Ridge complex of mainly fire use fires. And in that, we had 18 of our FMH plots that just happened to burn by sheer chance. Um, so it gave us a, you know, something great to be able to assess the effects of these fire use fires when normally we don't have anything set up in advance of them. Um, and one of the most surprising things about it was that with these 18 plots and, you know, a wide variety of fire behaviors, immediately post burn there wasn't a single tree, overstory tree, that we said had died. Now, we normally wait until five years out to assess that, but you know, people want to know, how many trees died, how many trees died? We said, well, at least on these 18 plots, immediately after the fire, we wouldn't say any of them had died yet, which was pretty darn surprising, and I think was a really good indicator of how well fire use can behave if you know, all the management, proper management practices are taken, and it's you know, being allowed to burn at the right time. Um, and there's one plot in particular that we went back to, and just this last year, we got our two-year data on it. And every single poultry on it, which was white fur, mm -hmm. and we were trying to reduce the amount of white fur. This was where 
um, the monitoring type where we've got white fur sort of encroaching on pure ponderosa. Mm -hmm. Every single white fur pole was dead. Not a single overstory ponderosa was dead. Maybe two or three overstory white fur had died, but every single pole. Mm -hmm. So I was quite impressed. And I've never seen that type of success, at least in terms of reducing um, you know, pole densities with any of our prescribed fires because we're generally not willing to burn that hot because there's too much of a chance of it getting up into the canopy. But, I mean, it's, it's really nice. Mm -hmm. It's quite surprising and impressive. Yeah. But on a prescribed burn that we had right outside of Moab, the surprising thing was is the amount of, of birds, wild turkey, and, and elk that actually came into the site no more than about three weeks after the burn. And I was just kind of curious how people, how other folks may monitor, you know, wildlife effects from, from fire. I think we do a pretty good job at monitoring the hard data, but does anybody use anything to monitor, you know, benefits to wildlife? Is there a protocol? I don't know if there's a, a what you might call a quantitative protocol, but I, in the past, have done a lot of aerial surveillance flights where you look at the wintering ungulates and where they're mm. distributed in comparison to burned and unburned areas. And ungulates use those those prescribed burns, especially in the springtime when the soil is warm because of the blackened earth and the more nutritious regrowth is is found. And so I don't know, I, I guess my in my some of my previous work we used prescribed burns in order to distribute elk away mm -hmm. from um, feed ground areas where they were artificially mm -hmm. fed because if you can train them using a very attractive kind of forage to stray away from the feed grounds in the spring, then they're less likely to spread diseases like brucellosis to each other. So um, we've been able to manipulate their distribution using burns and we're trying to do the same thing with bighorn sheep to try to mm -hmm to train them to go back to some of those ranges that they previously used before they were choked with trees. All right, now thinking of one of your recent Firefox monitoring projects, and it could be in the last you know, few years or, or so, what, um, what did you learn from that project that you think others might benefit from? But I'm constantly surprised, and this is certainly important, about how our data uh, may be used. Mm -hmm. once they leave our control. Right. And uh, I know Diane mentioned how important it is for the crew to be professional and, and involved in what they're doing. And also, we need to follow up in that manner with the way our data mm -hmm. are used. I found that it's important to be real clear what the objectives are for the monitoring, because a lot of people just say, just go monitor. But without knowing exactly what the question is, you don't know how to design the plots or how many to put in or where to put them mm -hmm. or what data to collect. So it's important to spend time up front with the people who you're working with mm -hmm. and um, probably really question them hard and nail down what the purpose of the project is so that you can do a good job in getting the right data. We really have to work with managers to convince them that you can't monitor unless you have objectives. Mm -hmm. And they'll come up with an objective like, we want to return the natural um, fire behavior to the landscape. We want to reintroduce fire. And that's a goal. And that is not measurable. <laughs> yeah, it's not a measurable. <laughs> method, right? And you can't monitor a, a goal. You can't monitor a concept. And so there is a lot of give and take with those managers trying to articulate an objective that can be measured. And one of the neat things that's a success story for me is that I worked with the Bridger Teton National Forest to write some guidelines that specified minimum acceptable monitoring requirements mm -hmm. for all prescribed burns on the forest. And the first thing that those prescribed burns have to have are measurable objectives. And then there's a minimum requirement for monitoring and then kind of a menu that managers can choose from to, to use other protocols to do additional um, monitoring of, of whatever their objectives dictate. One thing that I've found helpful in getting those specific objectives is looking at the burn plan because it'll have things like we want 10% tree mortality mm -hmm. and that's something you can measure. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it's there. I think something on more of a 
<clears throat> not project specific basis, but that I've learned in the time that I've been in this job is that as far as seasonal employees go, sometimes they'll only grow if you really allow them to. Mm -hmm. Like I've, I don't know, I guess I've been getting less controlling <laughs> as the years go by and trying to, you know, give more work opportunities and more decision making <laughs> ability to, to the seasonals. And, you know, I've just been really impressed with the results. Mm -hmm. Realize that, yeah, maybe they don't always do everything quite to the standards that I would hope, but they come up with some things, you know, that I never think of. But mm -hmm. the other thing is, if you are going to, you know, be giving them more leeway, be ready to give both positive and negative feedback because mm -hmm. they need to, you know, be able to grow and learn too, not just get the chance for freedom and then not hear anything yeah. back. To stay with the seasonal employee, um, one thing I've found is that uh, it, it gets hard sometimes because they want to get out into the field, and I do too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 8 in the morning and we want to be at our plot already, but the extra hour in the office, you know, making sure everyone knows where the plots are going, how many we're doing, um, do we have every piece of equipment, do we have extras, it really saves us a lot of time throughout the course of a summer, uh, just spending the extra couple hours doing that. Yeah, that's right. monitoring crews are a different breed of cat. They're, <laughs> they're smart and they're critical thinkers. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think when I present my fire effects data to managers that, that I should be nervous because it's an important presentation and they might have hard questions to ask, but really my hardest critics are the crews themselves because they want to do it right. and. If I propose to do something that's a little bit questionable or doesn't make sense to them, then they'll put their foot down. Mm -hmm. Although I, I do support the flexibility of these folks being able to kind of do their own thing, but at the same time, you also need a, at least a standard basic template that you can follow through on year to year so that data continues um, to have some integrity. So We have regional protocols that they're not required but they are compatible with the database that we use in the Forest Service. So if you're going to input the, the data in that database, then you're going to use these protocols. So we, we introduce them to the forest, and it's up to them if they choose to use them or not. So we promote them. There's something else that I've learned, which mm -hmm. is to allow plenty of time after the field work to do the data analysis, because one field day generates at least one office day of mm -hmm. work, and that mm -hmm. is the data entry and the report writing that um, takes a lot of time. Very time consuming. We do need to link the, you know, the practical and the, and the, and the data, you know, what's it saying? Mm -hmm. Obviously we are collecting a lot of information that, that can be very, very useful, but what has worked is a, you know, one or two page lesson learned on a particular project that, you know, okay, you're 90% complete or done with implementing the project. The line officers love seeing that kind of information, you know, the, Fire management officers, burn boss, you know what actually worked and what 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 can we what can we improve on, and make it more of a of a learning environment rather than a you know defensive you know environment. It's a very good policy. Two years ago at Grand Canyon, um, yeah, um, we did our first prescribed burn since um, before Cerro Grande, mm -hmm. and everyone was itching to finally get fire on the ground and. I mean, honestly, looking at it in advance, everyone knew it was kind of on the wet side of things. It was late in the season. It was late October, and it, we kind of started, and then it rained, and then we waited a couple of weeks. It kind of dried out, and then it was November, and like, well, maybe it's dry enough. Went ahead with the burn and really did a, a big air show and burned more than we originally sort of planned, but it was still within, you know, the parameters. And, you know, then we were done. We're like, hey, good job. We finally pulled it off. You know, we got 3,000 acres done. Well, we went out and read the plots, and uh, even just you know, going to the plots, you could see that <laughs> it was really, really cold burn. I mean, there were enormous patches of unburned fuel. And then we got the data and, you know, kind of gave them some feedback and said, hey, you know, it was great and I understand the pressure to get the fire on the ground and do this, but, if, you know, we, if we keep burning this late in the season, we are not going to be meeting our objectives. And they don't, you know, they don't want to hear that. They're under different pressures, you know, than we are as the monitors. but. You know, you still have to give that feedback. Yeah. That pre-burn briefing the morning of the first ignition is really important because that's when you can tell everyone who's going to have a drip torch in their hand what the objectives of the project are and what to target with their drip torch and maybe what to not burn, even though it'll make a 
big cool looking flame we don't want to burn the cottonwood trees so ignite over in these kinds of vegetation instead and I, I think that really helps a great deal if the if the burn boss pushes it pretty hard to everyone on the on the burn something that I've found um, in terms of trying to market the program or make people aware of what we're doing is just talking to people informally seems to be as successful as anything else I make a point of stopping in to just visit with the fire guys mm -hmm. and uh, take any opportunity when I'm riding in the truck with them somewhere to mm -hmm. talk about the program I'm doing and all the great results we're getting. Yeah. And that seems to get through better than the email reports that I send <coughs> yeah. out. Mm -hmm. so in Another reason why they would be interested in our data is for external relations to share with the press and with the general public when we're telling the story about all the good work we're doing. Mm -hmm. It really helps to have this, the numbers and the specific data. Yeah, this is what we did. Mm -hmm. And it makes it a lot more believable. And so that's one reason why the managers would really want to know mm -hmm. what we're doing. Some of your recent fire effects projects um, describe some of the best crew work that you've, uh, you've been with your crew. And why did it work so well? We've got a Grand Canyon. Um, a couple of plots that are, or a couple of groups of plots that are arranged such that it really makes sense to do about three of them in a day. And in the past, I've pretty much just told people, okay, we're going out, we're doing three. You know, and by the end of the day, they're pretty much shot. <laughs> this year, though, our schedule hadn't been as rigorous, and I didn't feel like I had to force people to attempt the trifecta, as we called it, on each of these, <laughs> on these two sets of plots. And we did the first two, and it was getting late in the day. We were not going to finish the third one before, you know, the end of the day. We couldn't walk out back to our vehicle and such and get home before, you know, close business. And I honestly didn't think anyone would want to do them. And before, like I said, I'd always made people do them. And both times this came up, the crew said, that's okay. We don't care if it takes longer, you know, whatever. Let's, let's get them done. We're out here. And I guess it surprised me a bit. The fact that both instances they chose to do this um, really impressed me. One thing we try to do is have some of the same people monitoring the fire behavior and the weather during a project as are going to be monitoring the vegetation afterward and hopefully who have been out there beforehand doing vegetation monitoring. And those individuals, they get to see the, the whole piece of the pie and that's great and consistency is really important because of that. But one of the hardest things we've struggled with is how to best monitor a burn while it's being conducted. What is the best mm -hmm. way to collect data that can be used to compare the fire behavior and the weather to the results on the ground? And that's tough because there's a lot of safety concern. You can't stand in the middle of a prescribed burn project with you know, with your thermometer out there with the flaming front coming toward you. Our last prescribed burn, uh, we had a series of uh, hobos, just those oh, uh, yeah. remote mm -hmm. units yep. um, scattered throughout uh, the burn, in addition to uh, two groups of uh, FEMOs taking weather every half hour, uh, regardless of where they were at. They would just mark their location and, and do it. And I think we got decent coverage. I mean, we weren't perfect but we were pretty good. Uh, you know, we work in a fire organization and it's a pretty <laughs> rules and regulation, militaristic style in some cases, but our employees are botanists. They're yeah. natural resources people and they don't respond well to, to military discipline and, you know, severe rules and regulations. They, they, they just are a, a different <laughs> breed and I'm glad you guys said that because I, <laughs> I feel like I've been in the exact same boat. And uh, really, this last year, I changed my hiring practices a bit to intentionally hire the best crew dynamic rather than to hire the most efficient crew. Oh. I'd always hired, before this year, I'd always tried to hire people who seemed to be the most qualified, had the best skill set, and would really just be able to bang out the plots. And we had heavier plot workloads in previous years, too. So in a way, it was good. but. We also had poor crew dynamics, but this last year, I intentionally hired people who were maybe less experienced, who I, I don't know, I just got the impression through interviews and such that they would be a better crew person. Mm -hmm. I didn't hire individuals so much as I was trying to hire a team. 
And we also had less of an intensive plot workload, so that, of course, helped <laughs> in that strategizing. But I just got lucky because it worked out great. Now, so you have a different situation because it's usually just you and one other. For yeah. crew di so your crew dynamics must be interesting because it's <laughs> I critical feel that you both. I very fortunate that I've mm -hmm. always had really good people that I like being out in the field with. Mm -hmm. And I think I do pay attention to those personal characteristics when I hire people. You know, is it someone who can get along with other people? But their work satisfaction satisfaction has a direct impact on, impact on our success when it comes to having good quality data that we can use for adaptive management. If they're angry or disenchanted or frustrated or distracted, any sort of bone-headed mistake that they might make out there, you know, six miles into the field will directly impair our ability to do our job. And so it is important to keep them invested in, in good work. And, and if they're not invested, we pay the price. Mm -hmm. What was the most significant thing you learned on, of any of the prescribed fire fires that um, were successful, where you met the objectives? You know, really, uh, really you were proud of that burn, and what, what did you learn from that? Fire well, after a fire, when the trees are scorched, it's hard to tell if they're going to live or die. And I guess I learned sort of through the grapevine that a lot depends on the weather after a fire, whether they live or die. And, you know, we made our best guess and turned out a lot of them lived that we thought were going to die. Mm -hmm. On a particular prescriber you're talking about? Mm -hmm. We usually are really conservative with that ourselves. And, if, and like in a ponderosa, if there's any, well, any tree, if there's any green, you know, we say it's still alive. We only call it dead once it really is dead. Because, yeah, drought or a wet year might really affect that. And I kind of wonder, had we not had such a severe drought after our 2001 fire use fires at Grand Canyon, you know, how many fewer of those trees um, wouldn't have died? You know, there, not too many did, but I kind of wonder if almost all of them would have made it. There's one that I wasn't necessarily involved in, but I looked at some data on when I used to work at uh, Lassa Volcanic National Park in California, and <clears throat> I did sort of an informal study of, you know, how effective their prescribed burns were in relation to their <clears throat> fire effects data and also you know, their fuel moistures and prescriptive parameters. And one thing that I found is that very few of their burns really were meeting objectives. They're generally too cool. The one that definitely did also had the most spots and was the greatest hazard to the people there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's really kind of empirical data. But I'd say based on my experience with a lot of other burns, you know, if, if a lot of objectives are based on, it seems like if you're going to meet them, you have to burn a little bit hotter than a lot of managers are willing to burn. If you, especially if you're going to meet all of them, you know, like reduce pole densities and reduce fuels. I mean, you can reduce fuels with a light surface fire, but if you're going to reduce pole densities, it's got to be a little hotter. And <clears throat> if you're trying to meet all of those in, you know, one entry burn cycle, it's often beyond the level of comfort that managers have with, you know, human safety. And you know, as they should, that should be that's the first concern in any burn. But I guess, I don't know if I'm frustrated by that, but I've always kind of noticed that. Mm -hmm. It seems like, yeah, if you're going to meet all your objectives, in general, you're going to have more problems than you're willing to deal with. Mm -hmm. So you either have to be content with scaling back your objectives or just meeting a few of them or relying on multiple entries into a unit to achieve all of the objectives. But most of the objectives, at least at Grand Canyon, aren't really written like that. Mm -hmm. They're just kind of written, and they don't say how many entries it's going to take to realistically achieve this. And maybe that's because we don't have enough data yet for the feedback loop, but that's what I've noticed. You know, if you don't meet your objectives, one of your options is to change, change your monitoring, change your objectives to something that's more achievable and not just change implementation. Sometimes we've had to change our objectives to something that, that is reasonable for us to achieve with prescribed fire when a stand replacing wildfire is the kind of fire behavior that would give us the results we wanted we're not going to have one of those so <laughs> and, and at least in in areas near development so well here's another example of where the data was useful is after a prescribed fire, about a year after, we found that the fuel loading was actually higher than it had been because of the scorching and all the needles and branches falling down. And so the 
fire guys realize that multiple entries are going to be necessary, that you can't do it all just in one. Mm -hmm. and, and so the data f fed back into the burn plan and um, helped. And something that they suspected was probably true, and now they had data to show to it. Show that. Good. Mm -hmm. How about the last question then? Um, what's the most significant thing you learned on, on prescribed fire you were involved in that went out of prescription? I'm thinking of a couple of prescribed fires that got away that I've looked at, and no structures were threatened. Um, some, the boundary was breached, but otherwise, no humans or life or property were threatened. But I have to say that those were the best um, resource burns I have ever seen. When the, the prescription Maybe the weather changed and and the fire behavior increased to the point where it crossed the burn boundary and went up the hill. That hill looks great. Um, all of our objectives are achieved on that hill. And it's, it's <laughs> really gratifying to see fire effects on the landscape that are exactly what we like to see. But if you think about it, we are ha we're in a stand replacing fire regime and if we want the results of a stand replacing fire, we have to have one. And if we have a very controlled late mm -hmm. fall, early spring ground fire, we're, we're not going to get there. Mm -hmm. So sometimes fires that get away yeah, on the, yeah, teach us something that's worth learning. Yeah. The outlet fire from 2000, um, I think I wasn't actually there when the outlet fire happened. Um, and that's def that one definitely was a prescribed fire that got away. Um, <clears throat> and the two things that I think we can really learn from that, the first is that, you know, it nuked <laughs> a lot of mixed conifer type habitat on the North Rim and people were, of course, you know, bemoaning the loss of all of that um, after it happened. Well, it didn't take long, in fact, less than two months after the burn, um, the aspen regeneration in those areas was out, it was incredible, <laughs> beyond belief. And I don't think anyone necessarily anticipated that. It wasn't you know, I mean, we know that aspen's a, you know, early successional species and it would respond probably well, but I think everyone's probably a little bit shocked about how well it responded mm -hmm. because, you know, it, the heat, I think, got enough in the ground without sterilizing it that, you know, all those old root suckers just, they shot straight up. And um, maintaining aspen on the north rim or increasing it has been one of our sort of unstated objectives, and it's been decreasing because of fire suppression and, well, hey, <laughs> there's going to be a lot more aspen after that. One of our objectives on a prescribed burn was just a broadcast burn and um, ponderous pine to reduce some of the understory. And we had, all, it was uh, rimmed by gamble oak and, and aspen, and it was a late season prescribed burn, and um, my instructions to the crew were to black line the unit and run it right into the the gamble oak and aspen is a natural, you know, barrier to, you know, containing the, the fire. Well, we all woke up the next morning and there was, you know, fire off the rim, you know, down off this one edge. And um, it just did not occur to me until we all looked at it that um, it was late season aspen that had had six weeks to dry with, you know, the leaves were off. And so it kind of crept its way down the, the bottom of the hill and it was definitely unsafe to put anybody in there to you know, cut it off because there was just too many snags. Yeah. Well, we've been talking about fire the whole time, but um, on the Prescott we do other kinds of fuels reduction as well, and I monitor those too. Oh. So we have brush crushes and we have goats, and I have plots out in those areas. And so that's very interesting information as well. Yeah, to, right, and that would be really good interesting information to share, mm -hmm. you know, the effects of that.